It has to be in feet. It must be in feet. If it's not this model, this model right here will not work. Your t, t stands for time. Got it. It must be in seconds. If it's not in seconds, this model right here will not work. Your time must be in seconds. S stands for your initial or starting height. Okay. This must also be in feet or this model up here will not work. Got it? Now I'm going to move on. Most of you will probably need to pause the video and finish copying this down. Okay? To give me some space, I am going to erase all of this. So if you're still copying it down, pause the video and copy it down. Now, Mr. Earhart, what in the world are you talking about? Ending height, starting height. Okay, I'm glad you asked. Back to the person standing on top of this building throwing a baseball down, okay? Now, let's say the building is 75 feet tall. You don't need to take notes on this. Just listen, okay? So here I am standing here with the baseball, all right? It's a big baseball, isn't it? And let's say my foot, my hand is five feet above the building. So the building's 75 feet, and then the ball's five more feet above the building. My starting height, that's your S, your initial or starting height is 80, because that's where the ball was before you dropped it, okay? So you'd put an 80 here now. If it fell all the way to the ground, then you would put a zero for your ending height because when the problem when the problem was all over, where was the ball lying at? The ground. What height is the ground? Zero. Now, well, Mr. Earhart, it's always going to be zero. No, not necessarily. Let's say I dropped the ball and I hit a guy that plays for the um, New York Knicks. Um, that rookie, whatever. There's one player this year's doing really well, a tall guy. But anyways, like seven foot four or something. Anyways, let's say it hits him on the head. So I drop the baseball and it hits him right here. Well, that's where the ball landed. So the ending height would be seven foot four inches. Of course, we have to use it has to be in feet. So it'd be what to say it was seven foot tall. We'd have to put seven right here <clears throat> because that's where the ball landed on his head. So the starting height is where the ball is before you drop it. The ending height is where the ball ends up at, okay? And usually it's going to be zero because usually the props have an ending up on the ground, but still, not always, okay? All right, so with that in mind, here we go. Let's solve this problem. <clears throat> here we go. <clears throat> that's falling from the building, okay? Now the starting height of the debris is 975 feet. See it? The initial, the ending height, the ending height is zero. Now technically, I know what you're thinking. Well, Mr. Earhart, <clears throat> how much time do people have after hearing the crash to get out of the way? In other words, how much time do they have before the debris hit them on the head? So really, the debris did not hit the ground. True, but we don't have the heights of different people. You know what I mean? They don't give that to us. So it's okay to assume we're talking about the debris going all the way down to the ground. So the debris starts here. That's the, that's the beginning height, and it ends here <coughs> on the ground at zero. So how much time? Well, look at that. We're solving for T. Look at that. We're good. Solve for T and we're done. Now listen. Stop. Think. Is this a linear or a quadratic equation? You must be able to know that you should know this now so easily. This is a quadratic equation because I have a squared variable and that's the highest exponent I have. So we've learned three methods. Square root method complete the square method and the quadratic formula method. Which one's the easiest and the fast, the fastest method? This method. But you can only use this method when there's no B term or no X term. Or in this case, we're dealing with T, so no T term. Well, guys, we're good. I don't see a T term. Yeah, right here, Mr. That's not a T term. That's a T squared term. I don't see a T term anywhere. 
recognize when you have a quadratic equation and then figure out which method you're going to use. Okay, I'm telling you, some of you are using the quadratic formula and everything, even problems like this, you're wasting so much time. Listen, if there is no B term, or in this case a T term, or an X term, use the square root method, bring that 975 over and make it negative. Now, <clears throat> divide both sides by negative 16. So negative 975 divided by negative 16 is a positive 60.9375. Negative divided by a negative is positive. Now take the square root of both sides and you get 7.8. Now you're used, listen guys, you're used to putting a what right here? A positive negative, correct? Not on this problem, because you're dealing with time. How could time ever be negative? It can't be. And by the way, what is time always in this formula? Seconds. So the people at 7.8 seconds, approximately, to, to watch out for the debris. There it is. This is called the drop formula and we're going to be using it in your homework okay and on upcoming tests and quizzes the drop formula okay moving on <clears throat> now i forgot to put the map so you probably will want to turn to page 232 on this problem and i apologize there's a map I'll, I'll try to draw it for you here it's like a triangle kind of like a right triangle and this is called the brown deer road i'm going to put b d r and this is called the Fund, Fondu Lock, I guess, I don't know. Road, and this other one is called I-43. I need glasses, my eyes are getting bad, I can't read. I-43, all right, there we go. Old age is setting in, I guess. Now, let's read the problem. You'll find this in your book. If you'll look at it, you'll see the map. Okay, here we go. You are downtown Milwaukee, you want to drive to Menominee, Menominee, Menominee Falls. This is Menominee Falls right here. I'll put MF right here. Menominee Falls. This is Milwaukee down here. Okay, now you're considering two options. You could drive this way nine miles north and then nine miles west. That's one way, okay? So I'm going to put a nine here for nine miles. I'm going to put a nine here for nine miles. Or you could drive northwest on Fond du Lac Avenue. All right. Now, I'm trying to see if they give us the di okay. They don't. They don't give us the distance here. Okay. So here's your choice. Now you would think, no, hold it. It's got to be faster to go like. It's got to be faster to go like this. Maybe not. It all depends on the speed limit. If this is a highway and a pretty quick road, it could be better. <coughs> now, excuse me. <coughs> Listen, um, the speed limit, here's the speed limit. You can average 53 miles an hour on Interstate 43. So, 55 miles per hour. Got it? Um, you can average 40 miles an hour on Brown Deer Road. 40 miles per hour, okay, and 45 miles an hour on this road. How much time would each route take? No, let's stop and think. Anytime you're dealing with speed, distance, time, <clears throat> this formula should come to mind. Rate times time equals distance. If you don't like rate, put speed in there, it's fine. Speed times time equals distance. Now the question is, is how much time would each route take? So you're looking for time. Do you see that? Okay, guys, everybody see that? How much time would each route take? So let's divide both sides by S. And what does time equal? Look at that. Distance divided by speed. Look at that distance divided by speed. So right here, I have the distance and I have the speed, don't I? See it? Distance divided by speed. So I'm going to grab my handy dandy 
grapher. I'm going to take 55 divided by 9, and I'm going to get 6.1. So I'm going to be on this road right here for 6.1. Let's see, we're dealing with miles. Um, okay, guys, I'm back. I made a mistake. I didn't make any sense. I was like, there's no way you're going to be on that road. 6.1 hours. Okay, your distance is 9 miles divided by 55. So 9 divided by 55 gives you 0.16. So I'm going to be on this road for 0.16 hours. Got it? Now come up here. I know my distance. I know my speed right there. So my distance is 9 miles divided by 40 miles an hour. So 9 divided by 40 is 0.225. 0.225. Got it. So what's my total time? Well, I've got 0.16 plus 0.225. My total time is 0.385 hours. That's my total time. I was on this road for 0.16 of an hour, and I was on this road here for 0.225 of an hour. Now let's come down here. Oh, I've got a problem. I've got a big problem. In order to find the time I'm going to be on this road, I have to know what two things. Time equals distance over what? The speed. I know the speed, but I don't know the distance. Hey, that's okay. Pythagorean's theorem, right? Can I not find this length of this line real quick? I have a leg, a leg. This is my hypotenuse. So leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. 81 plus 81 equals hypotenuse squared. 162 equals hypotenuse squared. Take the square root of both sides. Um, the square root of 162 is 12.7, so 12.7 miles equals the hypotenuse. Take the square root of both sides. So now I know the distance is 12.7. So now that I know the distance of this road right here, now that I know the, diff the distance, I can definitely find the time. How do you find the time? Distance divided by speed. So distance, 12.7, divided by speed, 45 gives you 0.28. So if I go up and then over, my total time is 0.385 an hour. If I go straight across like this, my time is 0.28, and that's uh, that's faster than 0.38, okay? So, um, it, no, I should do something. I'm sorry, guys. I should do something a little more. It does say how much time would each route take, so I should go a step further. If it's 0.38 of an hour, take 0.38 times 60, because there's 60 minutes in an hour, okay? 0.385 times 60, and you'll get 23.1 minutes. So I'm sorry. I should have been a little, a little more meticulous there. So 0.385 of one hour means 0.385 of 60 or times 60 gives you 23 minutes. Now 0.28 times 60 gives you 16.8 minutes. So there's the actual time that it took. Okay. So obviously this route's faster than this route here. Okay. Hope that made sense guys. So Mr. Earhart, how in the world did this problem here have anything to do with quadratics? It really didn't a whole lot except we had to use Pythagorean's theorem to solve this and thus we had to use, a there's a quadratic, this is a quadratic formula right here and we used the square root method, we took the square root of both sides. Okay, all right, moving on. <coughs> Page 238, number th example three now. Here's another formula you're going to be responsible for. So, so far we've learned the drop formula. Okay, H equals negative 16T squared plus S. You need to memorize that. I'd just like you to memorize this. Okay, you need to have all these things memorized, guys. All right, we're going to learn a third formula. Here it is. The area of a region formed by a parabola is given by this right here. There we go. Pretty cool. Look at that. Okay. Two-thirds times the base times the height. Now they get that from, there's a way to find the formula, the area of an elliptical object. And a parabola, a parabola really is like an elliptical object, if you continue on, and then curved it back around. Like that, you would have an ellipse. And so, and so they get it 
aside from that. But anyways, um, this is how you find the area of a certain um, region of, of formed by a parabola. Use this formula here, okay? B is the base, if you want to write that down. It's really, really, really cut and dried simple. H is the height. It's really simple, like I just said, okay? So, here's what they want us to do. They want us to use this formula to approximate the area of Pueblo Bonito, all right? As you can tell, I have no business attempting to speak Spanish. Now, in your book, you don't need to turn there, but you can if you want to. It's up to you, page 238. In your book, you'll see there's a picture of the of the city or the town, and look, it really is shaped like a parabola. I mean, very much so, okay? So let's pretend your parabola was going up and up like this. Okay, there's your parabola. Everybody see that? Oh, with the base P, with the base. Okay, anytime you go to find an area of a region formed by a parabola, it has to be a cutoff point. So they're, they're cutting it off right here. So the height would be right here from the vertex. Makes sense, doesn't it? Straight up to that line there, that's going to be your height. And the base is just this line right here where you're cutting the parabola off right there. Now, it can open downward and draw your line here. If you find the area of this region here, then this would be your base right here, and your height would be right here. It's really simple, guys. It really is. Okay? So, there's a picture of what we're doing. Okay? So, having said that, anytime you know the height or the base, you can find the area of a region formed by a parabola. Now, the shape of its foundation is approximately parabolic. It has a base of about 500 feet and a height of about 300 feet. Got it? So 500 and 300. So that means the distance across here is, use a different color, it shows up a little better, 500. Okay. Once again, here's your parabola coming down, curving up. And your height comes from the vertex. It always has to be from the vertex. Straight up. Your height, according to the box we just read, is 300. So do we know the length of the base? Yes. Do we know the length of the height? Yes. So we're ready for our formula, guys. We really are. <coughs> Here it is. My formula is right here, area equals two-thirds, base times the height, so I have two-thirds, the base was 500, the height is, what did we say, 300, so if you multiply all that together, you should get, I'm doing it in my head, I'm getting a thousand, okay, no, a hundred thousand, my fault, a hundred thousand, so if you take two-thirds times 500 times 300, you will get 100,000. Now, learn to label your answers. Those lengths right here were all in feet, so your area is going to be 100,000 square feet. Pretty simple, huh? Pretty cool. So you use this formula when you're trying to find the area of a region formed by the parabola. All that you have to know is the distance across the distance down. Okay. All right. Last problem. We're finished. <coughs> Excuse me. And I did not want to do that. Uh, okay. Here we go. Television screens are usually measured by the length of the diagonal. The oversized television at the left, and you're welcome to look at it, but you really don't need to. There's no need to put a picture in here. It has a 60-inch diagonal. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that. Here's my television screen. And from here to here is 60 inches. Okay. Pretty big, pretty big TV screen. The screen is 12 inches wider than it is high. Find the dimensions. Okay, now, first of all, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna call my shorter side X because then I can call this X plus twelve because.
notice it says the screen is 12 inches wider than it is high. Now, if some of you want to put your X here and call this X minus 12, you will get the exact same answer. No problem with that. Okay, students, that's totally fine. I like dealing with positives more than negatives, so I'm going to put my X here. If you don't believe me, some of you try it the other way, you get the same answer, okay? So there we go. Now, how can I solve for X? We well, have got to look for a formula or an equation that we can use. And you should see it right away, guys. You've got another right triangle. I'm going to highlight it in red for you. You've got another right triangle right here. So we can definitely use Pythagorean's theorem to solve for x. You better take some really good notes. It's going to be a little confusing. This is one of my legs here. This is one of my legs here. This is my hypotenuse. So I have one leg squared plus the other leg squared equals my hypotenuse squared. Now 60 squared is easy. 6 times 6 is 36, and add two zeros to it, so that's easy. x squared is easy. x to the second power is x squared. This is not easy, students. If you think it is, you're wrong. x plus 12 to the second power. x plus 12 to the second power means you have to take x times 12 times x, or x plus 12 times x plus 12. You have to write that parentheses twice. Now take this x and multiply it through x times x, x squared, x times 12, 12x. Now take your 12 and multiply it through. 12 times x, 12x. 12, 12 times 12, 144. <coughs> Add your like terms. x squared plus 24x plus 144. Now, in Algebra 1, I was not your teacher. In Algebra 1, you might have learned a shortcut. And if you did, that's great. Let's go over that real quick, okay? In Algebra 1, I know I teach it, and I, it's a great shortcut to use, and I think we should go over it just to make sure everyone remembers this. If you have x plus 12 squared like this, <coughs> the shortcut is you can square this and put it here. Square this and put it here. And then in your head, multiply these two together. What's 12 times x? 12x. And then double it. So put another 12x, and you get 24x. Okay, that's a shortcut. I don't care which route you go. Just understand how to do it, okay? All right. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and drag this over to the other page. So x plus 12 squared equals this right here, all right? And don't forget to put a positive sign right here, there. Okay, there we go, guys. Now, look, right away you should see you've got a quadratic equation. You have a variable with a power of 2, another variable with a power of 2. There are no other higher exponents. And unfortunately, look, I see an x term. That means I've got to, um, I can't use the square root method. The square root method is awesome, but I cannot use the square root method on this problem. Okay, so I'm going to have to, unfortunately, use the quadratic formula or completing the square to solve this. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to use completing the square. Okay, there's no way. So, let's first of all move everything over to one side. x squared, x squared is 2x squared plus 24x. Now bring your 3600 over and make it negative. All right, so bring your 3600 over and make it a negative 3600. Combine these two numbers, you get a negative 3456. Now we have one side equal to zero. We're ready for the quadratic formula. Okay. However, anytime you can reduce an equation, do it. And I can definitely reduce this equation. Divide everything by two. Two's cancel, leaving you with x squared. 24 divided by two is 12. 3456 divided by 2 is 1728. 
0 divided by 2 is 0. So there. Now I'm looking pretty good. I've got my equation as small as possible. I'm ready to use the quadratic formula, unfortunately. Okay, so here we go. There's a 1 here. That's my A. This is my B. This is my C. I have a negative sign here. I'm putting 12 in, so negative 12 plus minus the square root of B squared, 12 squared, 144. The next in your formula is negative 4. And then next in your formula is A times C. 1 times negative A times C. 1 times negative 1728 is a negative 1728 all over 2A. A is 1, so 2 times 1. There. Now next I'm going to have negative 12, positive negative 144, and then I have a negative times a negative, that's positive, and 1728 times 4 will give me 6,912. Alright, and now let's add these two numbers, and I'm left with negative 12 plus minus or positive negative. 70, or excuse me, 7,056 all over 2. So I'm doing better, guys. I'm really working this down little by little. Okay? Now, let's continue up here. Let's take the square root of 7056. When you do that, you're going to get 84. So now I have negative 12, positive negative 84 all over 2. All right, now, if this had not been a perfect square, then just round the number and put it here. Let's pretend we were taking the square root of 7086. The square root of 7086 is 84.17. Just put 84.2 right here. And then continue on. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Alright. So here's the problem. I've got two I've got two ways to look at this, okay? First I have negative 12 plus 84 over 2. Then I have negative 12 minus 84 over 2. Alright, now, <clears throat> when I simplify this, 84 uh, minus 12, and then divide it by 2, I'm going to get 36. I'm going to get 7. When you combine these two, you get 72 over 2, which is 36. When you combine these two, you get a negative 96, which is a negative 48. So there's what x equals. Do you see what I did there? That, that, we, that does not mean you are done. Okay, we're not close to being done. I'm just showing you. Put a comma here. Here's your two answers. Got it? I mean, not, not answers to the problem, but answers to the quadratic formula. Now, after we've solved all that, it's always wise to go back and see what in the world do they even tell us to solve for, okay? So let's pull this back up and look. They want to know the dimensions of the screen. So here's our original screen. We said this is x and this is x plus 12. So let's take each answer one at a time. Let's start with the negative 40. That's the easiest. If x is negative 48, that means right here for x I put what? Negative 48. My goodness, student. By the way, some students want to put negative 48 here and 36 down here. No, 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 no. Stop. You check out each answer one at a time. Forget this thing. It's not even there. Got it? Pretend it's not even there. Now, back to this. X is negative 48, so right here I can put negative 48. Well, that answer fails right there. How can you have a distance or a length that's what? Negative. That's not possible. So you know right away that answer right there is not going to work. Okay? So this answer is no good. Now let's try 36. If it doesn't work, then we put no solution. Can't be done. Okay, for x right here, I'm going to put what? 36. That's good. And then for x right here, I put 36. So 36 plus 12 is 48. That's good. So what kind of TV do I have? It's a 48 by, remember x means by when it comes to dimensions. It's a 48 by 36 TV, or we also call that a 60 inch TV. That's it, guys.
that's it. You're going to get frustrated with some of the homework problems. The homework assignment is really long. That happens every now and then, guys. Understand that. Attack it 